I'm joined by Tara Reid, who's a former staffer for Joe Biden when he was a senator. Uh, Tara Reid uh, publicly spoke out about how Joe Biden uh, sexually assaulted her in 1993. Uh, she has also released a new memoir now titled Left Out When the Truth Doesn't Fit In. Tara, thank you so much for joining me. It's a pleasure to have you on. Well, thank you, Richard. It's great to have you uh, to see you too. And I uh, really appreciated some of the comments you've been making um, regarding our geopolitical landscape. Thank you. Um, you know, earlier this year, you went on uh, Katie Halper's podcast and you uh, gave a really descriptive account uh, about uh, how Joe Biden uh, sexually assaulted you. And um, I wanted to ask you, uh, how long were you trying to get this story out and tell your story? Because I, for example, I, I saw that you were tweeting about this in January and, you know, there's people saying that, oh, this was politically motivated because of the primary. And, uh, you know, you were, you were talking about this way before that. So could you tell us more about how uh, you tried to get your story out and how um, uh, you were stonewalled, essentially? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, I actually, the first time was when it happened in 1993. I didn't come forward about the sexual assault. I came forward about sexual harassment and I filed a sexual harassment claim actually um, with the Senate. Um, nothing came of it. Um, and I was actually terminated by Joe Biden's office um, very soon after I filed that um, and as soon after the assault. Um, and I was unable then to get a job on the Hill. My career was essentially over uh, once that happened. And um, so then I went out with my life, which went on as it did. And uh, I discussed that in my memoir, um, Left Out When the Truth Doesn't Fit In. And you can find that on Amazon.com and tarareadauthor.com. So um, it goes more into detail of what happened, you know, immediately after that. Um, my daughter was quite small when the time when Joe Biden became vice president. Um, and we were still, I had talked about this publicly. Um, I survived a domestic violence situation where I really wanted to keep her privacy. And so there's really no mechanism or way for me to come forward. And second of all, I kind of, I, I was so far away from DC at that time, mentally and physically, that I thought that maybe Joe Biden had changed. Maybe this was my experience. And so I, I suffered with it. And I did talk to a few friends um, at that time, which has been made public, um, that I talked about right. that, you know, difficulty. Um, but it wasn't until 2019 when Lucy Flores came forward that I knew the behavior was still publicly quite, you know, that he had had done this to quite a few women um, or something similar, um, maybe to a lesser degree by some people's standards, but sexual harassment nonetheless. They called it unwanted touching, hugging, kissing, whatever, but I call it yeah. sexual harassment. And I think that it fits is. under the definition. Um, and... I, when I came forward initially, uh, Richard Painter and Edward, Edward Isaac Dovier, who works for The Atlantic, immediately started a narrative that I was a Russian agent. My story was sidelined. I was really marginalized. And then I started reaching yeah. out to journalists, trying to get my story, my whole history with Joe Biden, including the assault forward, and had a tremendous amount of difficulty getting a response. So he didn't just sexually assault you. There was also sexual harassment as you, as you just uh, elaborated. Uh, could you tell us more about that and what that uh, behavior was like? Well, I was in my twenties. I was quite, I was much younger and I had just come from a career of acting um, and modeling and um, in Hollywood. And I got into politics and then, you know, worked for Joe Biden. Um, and he would put his hand on my shoulder and then underneath my um, hair would rub my neck and do things like that. And he would just make it clear about him noticing me, if you will, more in a physical sense than a professional sense. And then um, I was asked to serve drinks because he liked my legs and thought I was pretty. And um, a legislative assistant um, whom, uh, you know, has refused to come forward, hopefully someday she will, did defend me and said, Tara, you know, this isn't your job. You don't need to do this. And there was an argument actually between staff about 
this occurrence. And so based right. on that experience after the sexual assault, after things increased and it was clear because I was complaining, you know, that I was going to be frozen out, if you will. Um, when I made the sexual harassment complaint, I was hoping to talk to someone in person and make and talk more about the sexual assault. It was really hard to discuss it. I did discuss the sexual harassment with my supervisors, um, the one who hired me, and all the way to the chief of staff, Ted Kaufman and Dennis Turner. Now, I want it noted that Ted Kaufman is still working with Joe Biden on his presidential campaign, mm -hmm. as is Dennis Turner. So a lot of those same people. And right. um, they've made it really impossible for me to be heard. And they've made it really impossible for me to move, you know, to, to uh, the veracity of what I was saying to be heard at all. Um, they're denying at first yeah. they denied they knew me at all. I uh, remember reading about this and I mean, I was, I was absolutely, uh, you know, flabbergasted by, by what they're saying here. I mean, this is uh, uh, the, the erasure is absolutely uh, staggering. Do you know of any other women who were working with you at the time or uh, that Joe Biden also uh, sexually harassed or assaulted? Did you ever see him uh, do that to other women as well or hear about it? They called it an open secret. Um, and I know he had some consensual. I do know of people that had had some problems. It's not for me to discuss. I mean, and I think that the whole thing with me coming forward and the way I've, my character's been attacked, even people that cooperated my story are afraid to come forward. Um, and, you know, for instance, one person that doesn't even know me who simply knows about trauma has had their work threatened there there has been trolled i mean it's it's been so um such a coordinated attack i would say that yeah people did have a story they're afraid to, to come forward regarding the uh, uh systems in place for women to come forward um i mean what from what you're telling us they were non-existent essentially uh do you think anything has changed since then in dc uh, do you think there's still a culture of sexual assault and, and harassment? Obviously there is. I mean, when I was there, they did a study and I think it was like 70 to 75 percent of staffers were experiencing that male, female, mostly female. Um, now I didn't know what the statistics are. They've tried to revamp the way that um, staffers come forward, but there was still a slush fund up until recently where they would use money to basically do NDAs or a non-disclosure agreement and silence people, basically give them money to, to not say anything. And it's just, it's a taxpayer slush fund. So there was, I think Gillibrand was one of the co-sponsors. It was a bipartisan effort to try to get rid of it. However, she came out against me. Now I know she's tied to the Biden yes. family monetarily, um, and so I, cause, but, but it's been shocking the way normally who would be surrogates or helpful to women's issues have simply left me abandoned because, right. because the perpetrator is Joe Biden. You mentioned Lucy Flores earlier, and I wanted to bring her, uh, uh story up. She's a former assemblywoman from the uh, state of Nevada. And in 2019, last year, she came forward saying that in when Joe Biden was still vice president, he inappropriately touched her, he sexually uh, harassed her. And I don't know if you've seen this, but on The View, they discussed this. And, you know, they were essentially trying to uh, normalize what Joe Biden did. And I think Whoopi Goldberg said something along the lines of, oh, you know, he's a hands on type of guy. Joe is Joe is a hands on kind of guy. And watching them rehabilitate this kind of uh, predatory behavior, I mean, what do you make of that, seeing that kind of uh, talk on television from other women? It's infuriating. And that was one of the things that made me come forward. Um, the way, not only the way they whitewashed, as I think I've heard you describe his reputation, um, but also just the way they attacked the women coming forward, calling right. them narcissists, calling them seeking it. No one wants attention for this kind of issue. I mean, I lost everything coming forward. I lost work, my reputation, you know, certainly doesn't do anything for your personal life. I mean, let's face yep. it. This is difficult to talk about because it's not just about a powerful person. Sexual assault and sexual harassment is a, is not, it's a difficult subject. It's, it's hard and people don't want to talk about it. Um, 
in any real substantive way. Um, what was really shocking to me was, you know, just the way they were attacked, but also, you know, sadly, yes. Lucy Flores, I mean, I, I would imagine out of fear, you know, she backed off calling it sexual harassment. She called it unwanted touching and said she thought of him as a grandfather and kind of even minimized it a little. Um, now, when I had what happened to me happen, he was in his early 50s he, at the time, my father's age at that time, and very powerful and very physically vigorous. So he wasn't this frail sort of Uncle Joe figure. Yeah, and uh, that's what uh, people tend to market him as, right? Not a rapist, a racist, a war criminal, which is, you know, what he really is. It's, it's always, now he's this friendly grandfather figure, which is, it couldn't be further from the truth. Um, you know, uh, speaking of how women who come forward are attacked, um, Lucy Flores uh, went through that. You have been going through that, I mean, to uh, an extraordinary extent. People have been calling you a, a Russian agent. I mean, these just ridiculous smears and never really addressing your claim and your story and your um, allegations and uh, your experience and what happened. Um, you know, how do you feel also about the the way that this was covered by the mainstream media, because, you know, the New York Times did a story. You saw a few stories. I think The Guardian as well picked it up. But, you know, if I go on Google right now, and all of these stories are back in May, and there hasn't been a peep since then. It, it's been, um, well, there's been a pattern of silencing or smearing, and that's kind of what I've been going through is the silence or smearing. And um, including even with my book, um, you know, it's being suppressed, and then trolls are trying to review it, and... Um, there's been illegal downloads of it, um, you know, all kinds of things to try to make it so that I can't be in work in the world, like um, make it difficult yeah. for me to, to even be in my own country. Um, as far as the, uh, you know, the other slurs that came was the social, was the um, class shaming which coming from Democrats who are supposed to be the champions of the working class, I mean, to class shame me right. about a sexual assault allegation, it was really um, cognitive dissonance, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's been, it's been stunning um, to see everyone's toe step. I think Glenn Greenwald really called it out when he said he was, he quit the intercept that he founded frustrated that he's been basically given a message to not go after Biden. We can't allow any yeah. one man to have this much power. It's dangerous. And I don't think it's Biden per se. It's the elite Dem or that little close circle that you and I are not a part of. And most of us, most of the people watching this, you know, it, like George Carlin said, it's a small club and we ain't in it. And um, yeah. they, are controlling information and that's dangerous um, because when you have controlled information it's like treating us like children basically deciding what we can know and what we cannot know you know do, do you feel that uh, this whole Russiagate hysteria in the last couple of years has exacerbated or made it harder for you to come forward or um, uh, because you know people say oh you're you're working for the Kremlin and they say that about Everyone who levies any sort of critique against Biden, be it uh, someone who's personally uh, been assaulted by them or, or someone who's talking about his policy. Uh, do you think that's contributed to, to this toxic atmosphere of, oh, we're not allowed to criticize uh, Democratic Party leadership? Absolutely. I mean, it, I think it's a tactic like, like um, you know, switch and bait, they call it. Look over here while this is really going on. And um, the, the neo-McCarthyism, this it's because, and for, you know, you're younger than me, but and, and actually this is way before my time, but McCarthyism was when they accused people of being communists and having Soviet ties and, and yeah. then they lost their way of living and it was really horrible. Um, and so younger viewers might not even know about McCarthyism. Look it up because it's interesting because we're in a neo McCarthyism, which is, you know, basically, again, accusing people of having alliance with Russia. Well, so what? We're not at war with Russia. Russia's our ally. There is no Cold War. Russia has the economy of Texas and 11 time zones. They're trying to keep their heads above water, I would imagine. I think that we pick on Russia because they're a convenient enemy. They're vast physically as a country, but with a smaller economy, and they can't fight us as well. However, if they align with other countries who can, that might become a problem. So 
I mean, I don't think it's in our best interest to continue that narrative of, of poking that bear, so to speak. And right. um, I think that it's really a distraction from what's really going on. It's rhetoric, the xenophobia, yeah. the anti-Russian narrative. I mean, um, even like recently, like the New York Times saying I had an online Russian boyfriend, um, which is ridiculous. I don't have an online Russian boyfriend. I never did. Um, they also, and but when I asked them about their sources, they wouldn't give me the source. They said, oh, well, we can't give our sources. And I noticed there was another story about Russia recently, which was much more serious, um, not a gossip story, but it was about, um, you know, the military having um, uh, something to do, and you can finish the story for me, but it was basically putting, you know, a price on the head of some U.S. soldiers. Yeah, these uh, alleged bounties, yeah. Bounties, thank you for the word. Um, and it wasn't true, and it was sourced out by other journalists yeah. that now th there, wasn't, there wasn't enough there for them to go forward with that story. Democrats are still using that narrative. Well, we put bounties on heads, and this is a fact, a historical fact, in Afghanistan. I mean, to Russian soldiers. I mean, and, and so yeah. it's just odd how we're taking some of the things we actually did and then flipping around the narrative against you know and weaponizing it yeah and then using it to invalidate um you know other people's suffering including yours and and that's what i find so uh utterly disgusting and it's just it's so outlandish i mean they're just grasping at straws to uh just bury any kind of criticism and and you know did they, I, I don't know i mean i can't even imagine how you must feel the russia thing surprised me it didn't bother me i mean i have views that are very um very firm i'm a progressive um i'm obviously not working for donald trump or the kremlin or republicans or anyone i'm work you know and actually i'm not working um which is more to the point um i'm you know and I am a progressive Democrat and I was a Democrat all my life and multi-generational and I left the Democratic Party um, to become an independent, but my views are progressive, not libertarian. Right. So, so I believe, you know, in healthcare education and I believe sexual assault and sexual harassment is nonpartisan. I want to read you a list of names. So AOC, Elizabeth Warren, Cory Booker. Kamala Harris, Pete Buttigieg, Julian Castro, Beto O'Rourke, they all called for Brett Kavanaugh to be impeached. Uh, Bernie Sanders uh, said he supports an impeachment inquiry, and this was over allegations of sexual assault um, regarding Brett Kavanaugh. I want to ask you now, did any of the people on this list reach out to you to offer their support, and did any of them call for any kind of inquiry or for Joe Biden to be held accountable for sexually assaulting you? No. I mean, AOC, I think, was the closest, but she was kind of lukewarm. So no, and no one reached out. I reached out to them and no one answered. What, what does that say about the Democratic Party if, if they are treating sexual assault now as a partisan issue? I, I think the Democratic Party is trash. I think, the, I think it's become trash. It's left 40% of its base, which is progressives, just abandoned. And the elite Dems have basically hijacked the party. And it's, it's a small group of very rich, old, white, privileged people that don't care um, about, you know, the American way of life or democracy. And in my opinion, it's super unhealthy. And, um, you know, as progressives, I think that half the party or more needs to stand up and say, stop it. Because you know what? The middle of the road is actually not middle. It's gone right, right, right. And, and you pointed out, I think in past podcasts about the warmongering, which, you know, we don't have to go into here, but you know, we've gotten very predatory and it's escalated more and more in the democratic party, the hawkishness. And it's, it's, it's fed this machine of, of defense contractors and, and money, but it's not serving um, working class people. It's right. not serving students. It's not serving, you know, our emerging um, environmental issues. How do you feel now that Joe Biden has won the election? Because, you know, the, the, for the, the trolls, the people that are saying, oh, uh, you only came forward uh, because it was uh, supposedly politically motivated. Well, now he's the president elect. Shouldn't they take your story more seriously? 
I, I would think that someone would look at it. Um, you know, I'm not really getting a lot of um, reach out from any kind of major um, mainstream outlets. Um, it's as if I've been dismissed. Um, I mean, I've been threatened with death. I've been threatened with going to jail. I've been threatened with election interference, with all kinds of things. No one's really come to me and said, hey, um, how are you? And did this happen? And is there a way we can look at this more closely? There's been nothing conciliatory about that um, and nothing happening. Um, I would say that, you know, I think for us to have a real conversation, there needs to be an investigation and perhaps maybe there will be, um, you know, from one of the uh, legislative bodies, but I don't hold any hope out. Other than that, I'm outside the statute of limitations for any civil or criminal action. So really what needs to happen is the conversation needs to move forward about me and let's not let this happen to another survivor. Please don't let this happen to someone else. Right. Um, because if they view themselves as successful with silencing me and harming me and basically, you know, crushing my ability to come forward, that tactic will be used again and again and seen as successful. I, I kind of expected him to deny, deny, whatever. I didn't expect the smears. One thing I found really interesting mm -hmm. was he said, oh, my story changed and smiled. And he smiled that really smug, arrogant smile. And my story never changed. Um, I withheld details in 2019 because I didn't feel comfortable, but then immediately reached out and tried to get yeah. someone to cover the whole history. So in fact, their story changed. They said they couldn't remember me. Then they said I didn't, well, first they said I didn't exist. Yeah. Then they said they couldn't remember me. Then they said um, that I was let go for performance reasons. And then they said I was let go for medical reasons, but they never, and then they of course, piled on with the class shaming. So I would say more examine that, examine the way the wet wagon circled and the way they came after me. That's what I noticed too. Uh, when I was uh, reporting on, on uh, your, your story, when you first uh, went on Katie Halper's uh, show is that their story, the narrative from the Biden camp uh, first silence, then, you know, denial, then changing details. That's what's crazy, and what I again I can't I can't speak for you, of course, uh, but I think just uh, uh, generally from you know a trauma point of view, what a lot of people don't understand is that it's very hard for victims to come forward, and you know it's it's not uh, for anyone else to decide when someone gets to come forward or how much they reveal, and I think that's really disrespectful and and uh, you know inflammatory for people to uh, dismiss you uh, based off of that alone instead of actually trying to understand what happened and hold Joe Biden accountable. Um, you knew Joe Biden when he was uh, still a senator, and uh, you mentioned his uh, cognitive abilities. You know, we've seen a lot of uh, uh, this brought up. Did he have what they call a stutter uh, back then when you were still uh, working for him? I don't recall any discussion about that. The only discussion that was had was about his hair plugs. We weren't supposed to talk about them. Like any of his personal stuff like that, there was no discussion about a stutter um, that I knew of. And he seemed very verbose when he was talking on the Senate floor. You've seen videos. Um, you know, it didn't seem to be part of the narrative. Yeah. So that's, that's something new. And I think they're, you know, again, it's like they're trying to play off. I think, you know, and I'm not a doctor, so I don't want to diagnose someone, but I, I he's very different on, from what I've seen in interviews now and his speeches mm -hmm than he was then. Very markedly right. different. Regarding his uh, politics, uh, his policies, do you think that he has changed in any way? Because something that we keep hearing is that, oh, Joe Biden is the quote unquote, the lesser of two evils. And, you know, now everyone is going to push him left. Do you believe that at all? Not at all. In fact, that lesser of two evils, I think Hannah, and I'm trying to remember her last name said, if you're picking the lesser of two evils, you're still picking evil. And, and he um, right. has 47 years of history showing exactly what he believes and exactly what he thinks about war. He's always been pro. Um, he's always been hawkish um, to the, even I would think right of Hillary Clinton, which is pretty hawkish. And um, 
He is very um, misogynistic. He's been racist in the past. I mean, there's recordings of him. He's talked about cutting yeah. Social Security at least three times. To, for him to deny it, and he denies that he did, is bizarre because we can we can pull back speeches on the congressional floor where he, he uh, we're on the Senate floor where he talked about cutting Social Security and he wanted to do it. You Indeed. know, I just the thing about Republicans is what you see is what you get. Um, and they seem to understand that their candidates have flaws and they don't really seem to try to hide it too much. They're just kind of, this is what it is. What gets me about the mm -hmm. Democrats is our hypocrisy, the hypocrisy part, the wolf in sheep's clothing. Oh, I'm going to appear like a champion of women's rights. But meanwhile, you know, I'm going to cover up the sexual assault and, and my past history of sexual misconduct. So, you know, like, that's what he's saying. And, and you know, Joe Biden yeah. covered up um, my assertion of what happened using his power and his influence, and he's still doing it now. And I don't know if he's personally how involved he is or how personally he was involved in my firing back in 93, but I know the people around him, like Ted Kaufman, Dennis Toner, are very involved. And... Um, as long as Democrats, like the list that you named, keep enabling and rewarding predators, we're going to get predators. That, that's actually um, an excellent point, because if Joe Biden is willing to lie about things that we can easily verify and pull up on record, I mean, and that, that's just concerning policy, never mind what he's doing in private, uh, what happened to you. I mean, I, I really don't understand how anyone can lend credence to, to him denying uh, your story and, and uh, just flat out refusing to even acknowledge uh, your experience and uh, smearing you. So it's, it's really incredible. Uh, Rose McGowan, she wrote the foreword in your new book, and uh, she, she accused Alyssa Milano of uh, being a fraud and hijacking the Me Too movement. Uh, do you believe that the Me Too movement has been hijacked and that uh, it's... Uh, being run by hypocrites, essentially? Absolutely. I mean, I think that Tarana Burke was the founder originally of Me Too, and it was really more about, um, you know, uh, women that um, had barriers um, by race or culture being mm -hmm. able to come forward and uh, with their sexual assault. And that was very clear. Alyssa Milano works for CAA, her husband does, which is a Hollywood agency. And she uses her platform to, you know, for the elite Dems to, you know, shout out their thing. And so she hijacked it during the Weinstein and, and, you know, Rose did a good job calling her out um, yeah. and continues to, um, you know, that's not my world, the CAA world, but you know, it's, it's startling how many connections they have with the elite Democrats. And I think of the American people, as they see more and more of this hypocrisy, they see more and more of mainstream media pandering and not giving proper mm -hmm. balance to news, to new information, there's going to be a frustration and I think an outcry and people are simply going to look to other outlets, you know, for their information. It's excruciating to watch yeah. the man who did what he did. And then, you know, all the harm that's befallen my family as a result of me coming forward, I can't describe to you what it's like to watch him get elevated to the most powerful job in the world. It, it's, um, it's sickening. Um, I'm trying to just get through day to day. Um, but I didn't want Donald Trump either. So <laughs> there you go. Uh, of, of course. Tara, uh, where can people find your book? Where can they get it? And uh, just tell us more. Okay, please. Um, Amazon.com. Uh, you can find it um, left out when the truth doesn't fit in. Tara Reed, R E A D E, um, or Tara Reed Um And you can find me on Twitter um, at Reed Alexandra. Um, so Tara Reed at Reed Alexandra. And you can find me there on social media and Instagram, Tara Reed Author, if you look for me there. So feel free. And I do communicate with people. And if you're a survivor, um, you know, just know that I don't regret coming forward and hopefully my book at the end gives some resources for survivors and um, kind of ways you can navigate something difficult. So I hope it helps. 
Tara, thank you so much for your time, uh, for coming on the show and sharing your story. I really admire your bravery, your courage, and uh, for being a champion for survivors everywhere. I really think people underestimate how much strength it takes uh, to come forward and share an experience like that, a very painful experience, and especially going up against one of the most powerful figures in the world. So I'm, I'm really grateful for you, as I'm sure many others are. Thank you so much. Oh, well, thank you. And, and I look forward to seeing your, more of your show. It's really, really um, informative. And I like what you have to say. So thanks. And I'll talk to you again soon, I hope. Yes, of course. Right. Take care. Thank you so much. Take care. Take care. Bye.